Dear colleagues, this is my great pleasure to welcome everybody to the Presbyopia meeting 2021 organized this year by Polish Presbyopia Club online. Uh, here, I would like to uh, um, introduce um, organizers. It's uh, our foundation of Thermology 21. Uh, as I mentioned, the Polish Presbyopia Club uh, and uh, this year also International Society of Refractive Surgery. This is the reason, as a matter of fact, why I speak English, because the, uh, the uh, um, opening lecture will be delivered in English. And the first session is also an international session with very renowned uh, speakers, uh, members of uh, International Society of Refractive Surgery. <clears throat> and uh, last but certainly not least, uh, the organizer is the University of Varmia and Missouri Department of Thermology, where I am a chair. Uh, and this is also a part of the uh, project, which is uh, supported by Polish Ministry for uh, Science and Education, um, called Presbyopia Science for Innovation, Innovation for Science. Here, I would like to introduce uh, my team who hardly worked and supported me uh, in the organization of this uh, meeting. Uh, Mr. Marcin Szymański, Mr. Szymon Wikanowicz, Ms. Aleksandra Lemanik, and Ms. Joanna Kolinska. And I would like to also mention about the sponsors uh, uh, who also significantly supported our meeting, like uh, Alcon. Uh, Topcon, um, Teleon, Ocustar, Zeiss, and the uh, um, journals like Journal of Clinical Medicine and Polish journals Optika, Przegląd Okulistyczny and uh, Medicina Praktyczna, the uh, biggest uh, internet provider of uh, medical education in, in Poland. Just a few words about the Polish Presbyopia Club. It was established uh, in uh, 2016. It brings uh, together Polish and international experts in the area of Presbyopia correction. And it is uh, based on two pillars, Polish Scientific Committee and International Scientific Committee. We are also happy to have supporting members, the best Polish clinical centers specializing in the application of modern uh, presbyopia correction methods and some innovative industry. Here uh, you can see um, on the left side, Polish Scientific Committee. Uh, I'm honored to be a chairman of this group. And on the right side, International Scientific Committee, which is chaired by Professor Jorge Alio. As a matter of fact, uh, two speakers involved in the first session, uh, namely Professor Pablo Artal and Professor George Baco, are also uh, members of our International Scientific Committee. We are very grateful, uh, all of them, uh, for this support. Uh, here, I would like to uh, thank and uh, mention our supporting members. As I mentioned, they are the best uh, um, centers uh, providing uh, anti-presbyopia collection correction in in poland and some industry uh, uh, entities we have already uh, organized uh, five presbyopia international conferences for ophthalmologists optometrists and representatives of the world of anti-presbyopia uh, technology and uh, mm, we were uh, given uh, a, a grant from mm -hmm. Polish Ministry of uh, Science and Education to uh, develop recommendations for <clears> the <throat> correction procedures in Poland. We work on this uh, um, for the last two years. Uh, we have established uh, um, four uh, expert groups uh, based on scientists, clinicians and industry experts. Uh, this uh, works were conducted in collaboration with the Polish Society of Optometry and Optics and the Polish Society of Contact Lenses. And uh, at our website, as you can see, you can find these recommendations. And uh, the session, uh, the second session during this meeting, uh, will be devoted 
uh, for presentation and discussion of these recommendations. Finally, we have also established uh, a platform, edu uh, educational platform for our patients, uh, providing most accurate and updated information about uh, um, anti-presbyopia procedures uh, available. You can see it here and welcome to, to visit this website. Uh, the, as I mentioned shortly, I will uh, present the program. Um, soon I will introduce the, the, uh, the first speaker and the... Uh, uh, um, Please uh, take uh, the off uh, your uh, microphones when you... Then we have, as I already mentioned, yeah. a session, joint session by Polish Presbyopia Club and International Society of Refractive Surgery. And uh, during this session, we will have a short discussion and after the session, because we have so many talks and uh, invited speakers from different parts of the world, as you see, for example, Professor Noel Alpins from Australia and Professor uh, George Baker from Canada, so distant places. And we, we don't want to keep our uh, important guests so long for the, for the discussion. And then at the, after this first session, we would like to uh, invite you to uh, to join the music performance by Professor Dan Reinstein, uh, who is a well-known um, saxophone uh, uh, player. So we are very happy and, and that, that we can provide this uh, also. Then the session number two, already mentioned, uh, will be on the presbyopia correction recommendations. Uh, of course, you have the program, so I will not discuss it in detail. And then the session number three, uh, news in presbyopia correction. And here we will uh, present uh, different technological industry developments uh, might be uh, interesting. And the end of the conference. I would like also to mention that we have a good collaboration with the Journal of Clinical Medicine, and I am a guest editor of the special issue Hot Topics in Presbyopia 2021. And uh, you are um, uh, very welcome to um, submit your um, papers, uh, your articles to this uh, journal. It, is, it has a very good impact factor over 4.2. Uh, and I'm happy also uh, to share with you uh, a very recent information that the uh, book I'm an editor and co-author, Artificial Intelligence in Ophthalmology, has been just published a few days ago, and it is already available. And there are some chapters also about, for example, how artificial intelligence can be used in the uh, uh, IOL calculation methods and some other issues related with anterior segment. For the first time this year, we uh, introduced the Vincente Fukawa lecture. Uh, why Vincente Fukawa? Mm, he was the uh, pioneer of the uh, uh, in a refractive lens surgery. As a first person, uh, he uh, performed the clear lens decision, which is still named as Fukawa operation in 1887. And by the end of the 1889, he had successfully treated 16 patients. On the right side, we can see the original, his paper uh, in German. Um, from that time, there were many re references to his uh, name and the Foucault operation. So uh, um, also by many, uh, unfortunately forgotten, he, he was uh, still present in many publications. And uh, um, as you can see from this slide, he was born into Polish family in Zhukiev, which is not very far from Lviv, uh, now uh, at Ukraine. At that time, it was Polish Galicia. He specialized in ophthalmology in Vienna under famous ophthalmologist von Arlt. And then he worked in different cities uh, like Pilsen and Karlovy Vary. And then he returned to Vienna where he finally uh, died. So certainly he's very uh, important representative of uh, Polish contributions to the, to the world of ophthalmology. And uh, mm, uh, we invited uh, uh, one of the most uh, mm, renowned and uh, important uh, 
uh, World Ophthalmologist, Professor Jorge Adio, to deliver this uh, uh, lecture for the first time. Uh, we are very grateful uh, to him also, also because of his uh, support as a chairman of our International Scientific Committee. Professor Jorge Adio is a professor and chairman of ophthalmology at the University of Alicante. Uh, and his uh, major expertise is in cataract, cornea, and refractive surgery. He performed over 55,000 ocular surgeries uh, during his uh, surgical career. He is uh, author and co author of nearly uh, uh, 700 peer reviewed papers, uh, nearly 400 book chapters, 100 books, and uh, over 2,000 presentations. Uh, um, he has a very high Hirsch factor, 68, uh, and uh, he uh, has uh, received over 100 international and national awards and recognitions. He's also a member of two very prestigious organizations, Academia Ophthalmologica Internationalis and the European Academy of Ophthalmology. Of course, uh, his contributions uh, list is much longer, but at the end, I would like to mention that he is also the founder and the director of the online university expert course, Refractive Cataract and Cornea Surgery, which involves uh, nearly 300 multimedia teaching activities and the acknowledged level of the university expert by University Mikkel Hernandez in Spain and the ICRS American Academy of Thermology. Mm -hmm. So th this is this is a very high quality educational course. And now I would like to welcome Professor Jorge Alio. Well, thank you very much, and I hope that you can listen to me properly. I'm extremely honored by by this uh, distinction to deliver the Fukana lecture. And you forgot to mention one thing in my CV, which is that I am very good friend of, of Polish ophthalmology and Polish uh, people in general, you know. During my student times, I had the, the, the possibility to visit many times in Poland and I could even speak a little bit of Polish. So my memories from Poland are unique. And I always say that Poland is the Mediterranean of the Eastern countries because of the character, the warm uh, personality and the many friends that I have found always there. So having said that, let me go through the topic of this focal lecture 2021, which is the correction of pseudophakic presbyopia with multifocal intraocular lenses with neuroadaptation failure. And the problem in this uh, case is what to do, because we have, in these cases, very important problems to solve, that it, uh, which will be the topic of this presentation. I have obviously to mention Vincent Fukala. Uh, I, I hope I'm pronouncing the name properly, bo uh, born in 1847 and died in 1911. He was really the, the early a creator of intraocular refractive surgery, as has been already mentioned. He studied in Vienna, as we mentioned by Professor Grichowski, and he was the pioneer, indeed, in a strategic crusade lens in high myopia to eliminate the dependence of glass. So the aim of this surgery, Fukara's technique, was to treat myopia and to eliminate myopia with a, something that has been considered as the foundation of intraocular refractive surgery. This is the, the, the renal paper and the, the paper that was really uh, known and from which he, the, he got his, his fame and his distinction was the publication and uh, translated in the American Journal of Ophthalmology. Fukala reported 44 patients that were successfully treated in total on part of his myopia by the use of, of uh, the crystalline lens extraction and reported also that different surgeons with uh, very, very prestigious names that were following his a technique and a hard performing a relevant number of cases. Uh, he published the list of patients that in which he delivered this technique and he, this, the, that include many young people and intermediate age people and uh, he uh, reported his results and results were good initially but as uh, the famous John Burns wrote later uh, from more than 2,500 re registered surgeries uh, that were performed at the first decades of the 20th century many of them abandoned the technique because of the problems of the retina. And this problems of the retina was really, uh, was the problem that we found and was why this, uh, this surgery was abandoned at that very moment. But uh, the Fukala concept was a seminal one. This, it was not a wrong one, it was wrong because the age and the, and the complications that were delivered, but he was the, the, the one to indicate that the way to, to, one of the ways to treat refractive work was the crystalline lens and later on, 
it was really not the, to eliminate the lens, but rather to implant a different lens in the same place in order to correct the, 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 the fact error. So he delivered the good way to go and the alternative, which is the use of a different lens in order to correct myopia. This is indeed one of the premium ideas that was lost, not only for myopia, as later on for other purposes. So the systematic use of intraocular lenses has been followed by the pioneer work of Ridley. We know that from that moment in the 50s, we uh, had the initial idea not, not to eliminate the lens, but to put a lens as well as the complementary concept of lens refractive surgery. So Fukala and Ridley are to be considered the founders of this movement. And later on, the expectations of the, of the, of the patients have been raised because not only we were able to restore aphakia, which was a very, very uh, annoying uh, refractive error, but also to replace by different optical technologies that promote the correction of hard refractive errors, presbyopia, and the, this indication was even reaching older age groups that initially were interested in that because most of the people now are, intent, uh, are entitled to be especially independent for far. The problem is when we try to do uh, things for near, and this is when the, 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 we have a patient expectation that is more, uh, more, not only that restoring the vision, but restoring spectacular independence, not only for far, but also for near. This is the concept of premium lenses in which we have as the uh, ones available today, the premium lenses. The, with the premium lenses, the surgeon has the opportunity to offer through very particular optical technologies a correction for far and near refractive errors. So the figure press VIP is a target and has been addressed by refractive or diffractive technologies and more recently by extended depth of focus technologies that all of them try to implement the intermediate and near vision, making the patient spectacularly independent. The issue is that uh, these images and are created are multiple and being multiple, they require an, a process of learning. The learning process is made by the brain with a neural adaptation that indeed, indeed involves uh, superior functions of the brain that has indeed the function identifying the right images, identifying and eliminating those that are not right for the purposes, and also the optical phenomena that is associated to these multifocal images. If the brain is not able to adapt, then we have what is called neural adaptation failure, which is a, neuro, a, a failure in which we have inadequate visual performance of the patient for many, for all these studies, or particularly for one, with a decreased consistency, with a patient referring bad quality of vision, faulty phenomena frequently associated, and in unexplained visual complaints, difficult to understand by the surgeon, but uh, and difficult to explain by the patient, but in general, distortion, bad quality of vision, inadequate visual acuity for far and near, or for near or for far, and basically, unsatisfaction of the patient. So the rotation failure are, uh, are not, not that frequent, but happens. Uh, we have the, uh, in, in all types of multifocal lenses, and most of them can be treated by extraction of the lens and substituted by a mono monofocal lens. It's true that the, that the surgery is performed losing the principles in which the, the aim of the multifocal lens was based, which is to eliminate glasses for far and near. And the, the idea is how to keep these patients in a better way is planting and implanting again a lens that is capable to keep the near vision standards of the patient. So rather than multifocal lens, to implant a multifocal lens. Is this feasible? Is the exchange of lenses feasible? Is this a very challenging idea? And this is what, what is about this consequence, this, this uh, lecture. So the rotation failure can be treated in, if possible, what, uh, in case that happens with multifocal IUL exchange by multifocal. What we can do when a failure exists, once that we have treated all the different ways to, to try to, to identify the reason of dissatisfaction, eliminating the previous refractive error, eliminating aberrations of the cornea, basically the patient is unsatisfied even using glasses. What to do and what we're going to show to you now is how we can improve these patients and we can recover the patient on satisfaction using multifocal IOL exchange in, in, in substituting the lens by another multifocal optic of different design. I'm going to report to you the clinical outcomes and patient satisfaction. I have to acknowledge that I work with many companies dealing with multifocal lenses, but this, this presentation is free from any a commercial bias. First, we perform a clinical study one. Clinical study one uh, in which we uh, did uh, uh, the exchange of the multifocal lens by another multifocal lens of different optical technology. Why we consider th that this could be feasible? Why we have the seminal idea? The reason is that following different studies, and I want particularly to mention the studies 
by multiple with magnetic resonance of the brain, we see that different areas of the brain are activated by different types of multifocal lenses, but particularly diffractive lenses are stimulating different areas than refractive lenses. So we try to identify in this basis with it, proving neuroadaptation failure, whether we have better clinical outcomes and we'll solve the problem of patient satisfaction. We had, uh, and this is in the way, the way to publish this on the peer review now, 25 patients with 50 uh, eyes in which we explanted the lenses that were implanted, substituted by a diffract by different technology. Those that were implanted with refractive lenses, we changed to diffractive. Those that were implanted with diffractive, we changed to diffract to refractive. And we have been using different types of ways to assess not only the outcomes in terms of objective uh, uh, data, but also the subjective field of the patient. Here in this slide, I'm going to show to you which splanted lenses were done and which ones substituted. As you see, the refractive lenses were substituted by diffractive and diffractive lenses by refractive or EDOF. We consider for the purpose of this study, EDOF lenses are refractive because none of them are really based on diffractive technology. They are really EDOF. Let me show to you uh, in this video how is the solical technique. Solical technique is based in, in, in these uh, videos that I'm showing to you, in one that I'm using uh, the, the, the technology uh, uh, that, uh, that explanted technology of place haptics. The video is not running probably. Our friends in the in the IT uh, cabin can activate the video to be run. It's not running. Let me see if I... Um, it's important to know the technique because many details are involved in that. Uh, can you please activate the video? In this video, if I can also show to you, the first one is case one. Okay, this is the video. Thank you. This is the first case in which we had the implantation. This was the, 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 the wife of one of my best friends, American friend, came to Europe to be implanted with a lens, this is refractive uh, lens, body, uh, body focal with asymmetrical optics. This is a refractive asymmetrical uh, rotational uh, intraocular lens. But after three years, I'm talking about three years of complaints, the patient was 20, 20, year one, but was not happy because of distortion. So see how three years after we can uh, ex explain the lens, the patient was implanted with a casual attention. Rate. This is a key factor in the explantation. If you have a CTR, then this one is feasible. As you see, I'm making a cut, a, a rider cut, and then I'm dialing off the lens, and then I'm using the, the Lisa tree because when we, we have a plate haptic, a lens we re-implant with a plate haptic lens of different technology. In this case, it's a diffractive lens. See how I am implanting this 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 uh, new lens. Remember, the case was operated three years before, and we took with the visual aspect the chance to eliminate part of the epithelial ring growth that happened in this case. Now, let me show to you the, the exchange of one the, uh, diffractive lens, the one that uh, that, that is uh, implanted is the um, the restore. And I am, as you see, separating the anterior capsule. This case was operated after one year and a half from the surgery. And then with viscoelastic, I'm dissecting the posterior part. I'm dissecting now the haptics. The haptics are always a trap in the periphery. And with a capsule tension, you keep a, 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 the, the, the sonar fibers in most of the cases untouched because otherwise you are going to dis, the, dislocate the casual back and you, this will create an in, an unstable casual back in order to implant the next lens. And I am now going to expand this lens in the same way and bring it in the anterior chamber. I'm keeping it with a radial cut and then following the use of dispersive and cohesive viscoelastic in order to protect the, the, the endothelium and also to, to protect and to cure a deep anterior chamber, a deep uh, casual back. I'm cutting and splanting this lens uh, dialing it out from the eye, as you see, with the forces. This uh, is use, usually an incision of 2.75 millimeters, with, which is enough to expand this restore lens. In this uh, place, I'm implanting a, a refractive IOL. This refractive IOL is a multifocal one that really is going to, to, to test the capability of the eye to narrow adapt to a different optical technology. In this case, it's, a, it's a, just the opposite to the previous one. Is a, 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 a symmetrical optical a, a lens, which is the Oculentis 1.5. So we have evaluated here how is the quality of vision questionnaire, etc. Everything about the, the outcome, and this is the, the outcome. And let me tell you that with the mean age of the change was 61 years old, but we implanted all type of ages, and the, the explantation was decided once that the patient was having a, a, a glass test in order to eliminate the possibility that there was a refractive error 
procedure that was the creation of the of the problem. Uh, the expansion was in an average of 12 months, that is one year, but look at the large standard deviation because we are now making this uh, exchange even two months after the surgery. We clearly identify that the patient is going to be happy because now we know when the ladies will fail because the syndrome, the syndrome is good, this is strong enough not to be followed by any possibility. So during that, we had this exchange that was the first conclusion of that broad vision. Faulty phenomena was the second, insufficient near vision, and then we had the diplopia following the probably uh, progressing the alienation of the lenses one or both. All of them were associated to the neuroaddition failure. The outcomes indicated that uh, in this case we had uh, an improvement in binocular on corrective for distance and corrective for distance visual acuity, even that there was no change in the spheric acuity. Good news because not, a, a, not, not changing significantly the refraction, we improve vision on corrective and discorrected. Good news. The three subscales for the subjective quality of vision questionnaire, frequency, severity, and the were uh, improved in a significant way following the change. Patient satisfaction improved because we had patients with good and very good satisfaction increased from 33.3 to 83.3%. And with the patient were asked if they would repeat the story 20% answered yes with the multifocal one, but 90% with the multifocal two. That means that these patients were happy enough to go for the, the for the story again in case that this happened. We compared these outcomes with uh, the second uh, group in which we study the, uh, the explantation of the multifocal lens and the implantation with a monofocal lens. We investigated exactly the same outcomes as we measured in the group one in which we implanted multifocal and exchange by a multifocal as well. Here you see the lenses that we had implanted. As you see, we have both diffractive and refractive. So this problem is not ex exclusive for refractive or, or diffractive technology, but we have this notation failure in about 50% of the cases that we decided to run for the surgery on an equal basis. As you see here, the quality of vision scores for the frequency severity and bothersome sub squares improved significantly following the explantation of the multifocal lens and the implantation of the monofocal. Good news, indeed. With visual function in this point 14, indicates a trend towards worsening, although not significant, the visual function of these patients. So in spite that we improved the, the best quality of visual acuity and the unquality of visual acuity was worse for near, these patients were not qualifying the outcome as satisfactory in terms of quality. Patient satisfaction sought to have an increase in the percentage of patients satisfied with their far vision and a decrease in the percentage of patients satisfied with the near vision. Obviously, we were implanted a monofocal and patients were not satisfied because the initial purpose of the surgery with the first lens was to have a spectrum independence for far and for near. Then we had a comparison of the multifocal by multifocal with the monofocal, multifocal by monofocal. Group one versus group two. What happened? As you can see here, no significant changes are seen in the spherical equivalent binocular uh, corrective for distance visual either with a uh, mono and multi, but uh, there was a highly significant difference in near vision in the multifocal and multifocal group. I have to tell you that this slide was corrected by the last, latest version that I did, was not included in the slide. This slide uh, is wrong in terms of the numbers, but keep the message. We have highly significant uh, difference in near vision with a multifocal by multifocal group, but no differences in the other uh, the comparisons. All the three subscales of the quality of vision questionnaire in both modalities were uh, uh, improved with no significant differences between the two groups, group one and group two. Here we have the far distance score was uh, was definitely improved, but not the intermediate and the and the near, which ought to be significant different in group one group two. two. In other groups, in, in other words, group one ought to be better for intermediate and near vision scales, as uh, demonstrates this slide. Patient satisfaction was significantly less in the multifocal by monofocal group, and the conclusion of these uh, two groups in which we uh, studied the outcome of patients re-implanted multifocal or re-implanted monofocal following the rotation failure in different types of multifocal intraocular lenses is number one. The change by different multifocal lenses of a different optical profile shows to be an efficient procedure to treat multifocal IUL neuroadaptation failure. Very good news, we have a solution for these patients. Our successful outcomes using different optical multifocal optical technologies indicates a very important scientific issue. Different multifocal profiles, diffractive or diffractive, follow different types of neural adaptation process. This confirms the initial observations of multiple magnetic resonance and indeed indicates that we have different areas of the brain involved in neural adaptation failure with different technologies. 
This approach demonstrates to be more efficient than multifocal IO association by a monofocal lens. Despite of what we could we consider, the satisfaction was less, the vision was the same, there was no improvement, no advantage in using a monofocal lens in changing the initial field in multifocal because of the rotation problems, but rather was the multifocal it changed more successful than the monofocal. And our results encourage further research about the mechanism of the rotation in multifocal IO surgery. Indeed, this is a mystery, but if you consider that we have our brain adapted to monofocality because accommodation brings a monofocal uh, uh, image because change in power of the eye, multifocal uh, IOLs are not physiological, and probably we have different uh, ways with different uh, uh, venues to accomplish the adaptation that could be successful or not. But at least we have now a guide how to solve the problem. One guide is, is change the multifocal list by another optical technology and the second monofocal list, which is obviously successful, but not as much as the previous one. I want to thank you for uh, from Alicante. Alicante is in the southeast of Spain. Many of you know where we are. We have a beautiful landscape. And I invite all of you to join us in any of our meetings and indeed in our course, which is uh, the one that I'm showing to you and was mentioned by Professor Wichowski. We have this seventh edition of this university certified uh, specialization course on refractive coronal lens surgery that is offered on, uh, with 500 hours of multimedia activities covering all the topics for the in, uh, comprehensive refractive surgery of other invasion. I invite all of you in the aim to join this uh, wonderful service society, which means so many patients satisfied to join this course because in my opinion it's, the, it's unique and it's the only one that you have with this comprehensive approach. I want to thank again Professor Grichowski and the Presbyterian Society that, in which I have the honor to chair the International Committee, the Civic Committee, for this uh, honor to deliver the Fukala uh, lecture and for this time that you have devoted to my uh, presentation. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Jorge, for this uh, excellent lecture. Uh, we are very happy to um, have you here and to listen to this uh, great presentation. Now we can start a short discussion and uh, I'm just uh, watching the, the chat panel uh, if there are any questions to, to our uh, speaker. Uh, I have, as a matter of fact, uh, two, two questions. The first well, it was obvious from, from, from your presentation that we have a problem with the, how to predict which sort of a multifocal IOL is best suited for an individual patient. Uh, how, we can, how we can manage that? Is, is there any way how we can, how we can work on that um, to, to, to differentiate, to, 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 uh, between, uh, for, to, to uh, choose between diffractive and refractive for an individual patient? In, in the, of course, in the terms of the future neuroadaptation. Thank you very much, Andre. Indeed, it's difficult because diffractive technologies have the problem of multiple images and light dispersion. You know, the, like, needed by this, you have a decreased contrast sensitivity, especially in high frequencies, and you have multifocal images that have halos. Halos are representing the different super, uh, superimposition of a different foci on the retina. In, in, the fact, in refractive technologies, especially rotational asymmetrical, you have a different uh, problem, which is distortion. These lenses usually don't cause a decrease in contrast sensitivity, but the multiple images ca causes a, a starburst, can cause halos as well, but definitely they create a preferred distortion. The more uh, the power, the more the distortion. So if you want to be in the safe area, you have to choose, if possible, a low power near vision art in the refractive. For instance, the, uh, the occulent is 1.5, which is now called the Teleon uh, uh, value, or to choose a diffractive lens that has also low power. Even with a low power diffractive, the problem of loss of sensitivity and the halos is existing. So there is no, no, no key to open the perfect choose, the, the perfect choice. There is no way to, to select properly. Uh, you have to, to gain experience in selecting the lenses that are given the best uh, results in independent uh, studies. And listen, don't, don't, don't pay attention to commercial biases because they will lead you to many problems. I can remember uh, the, the initial uh, well propaganda and uh, when they announced the Restore, which was the first probably popular uh, multifocal lens that was uh, not talking at, at all about halos and glare. This is the most frequently planted list in our hands, even that many patients were also successful with, uh, with this implantation. So answer to your question, 
difficult to answer. You have to gain experience. If you use low near visional lenses, refractive, rotation asymmetrical, you will do better. And if in the diffractive, you have to choose a technology that has the less condensity loss. In my hands, the one that functions best is the, the size Trilisa, the Metallium, follow and very good by the Reiner one at this moment, and the intensity which are less for Hanita lenses, but there might be others that can give good results, but these are my three choices now. And the refractive indeed, I like very much the profile that has the Teleon, which is a 1.5 uh, power for near. I have never expanded one of these lenses and they are basically neutral for neural adaptation. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Uh, since, as you, as you, as you nicely pointed, neural adaptation is a is a brain feature. Do you think that we might be able in the future to uh, influence neural adaptation by any training or maybe by pharmacological methods? As we all know, well, brain has some plasticity, and in different uh, fields of medicine. It, it, well, there are different studies on this uh, on this uh, ongoing. What do you think about that? Well, you know, the adaptation is a is, is a learning process, and the brain is learning how to use different images. I mentioned in my talk that now we are expanding as lenses as early as two months after. Why? Because it is a headache to have these patients one year long in your office, complaining that quality of vision is bad, that they cannot drive, that they cannot perform. They, creating a bad reputation of you and, 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 and around. So once that we identify clear the rotation process that is negative, we change the lens because it's very successful. So number one is you uh, make your, your choice. Once that you identify these patients that are clear, you know, they are patients with bad quality of vision, usually not achieving best quality of vision activity, very unsatisfied, unable to perform some normal activities. And on top of that, they don't improve with classes. Very important because the first reason of patient dissatisfaction is not the rotation, but refractive work that is left for winter. The surgery. Having said that, the second is the time. The time is a factor, but it's not always successful. Some patients adapt after six months, or basically they, they, they don't complain that much because they always have halosangular neural rotation as a learning process is slow and is po possible. They, most of the authors wait six months for this plantation, but one probably is that waiting longer you have a much more difficult expansion. So my point is, at three months, we evaluate the patient. The patient is not happy at all, and it has a clear neurodegeneration syndrome. We should the lens. The patient is borderline, is more or less uh, adaptable, has a positive personality. Those pers positive personalities are those that learn faster. Then we give a chance and wait a little bit more, up to six months. But now we are very aggressive on this. If we identify the syndrome, it's like we identify cancer. When we know that it's a cancer, we don't allow the cancer to grow. We wouldn't define the rotation failure. We don't allow the, the syndrome to, to, to remain for a time that is not adequate for the patient. Thank you very much. And uh, again, uh, I would like to thank you for delivering the uh, great lecture. I will uh, mm, uh, share and present your uh, a diploma for delivering this lecture when we meet uh, personally. Hopefully, it will be very soon. Thank you okay. again very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.